Fleisch, ja, die Azaleen da. Hier gibt es auch Gemüse, ein bisschen Kräuter, auch Rosmarin. Hier ist rote Beete, das ist Fenchel, die Rüben. Sonnenblumen hier. Ja. Die Kinder essen wahnsinnig viel Die herrliche Zeit, die wir im gemütlichen gastlichen Hause Hörs verlebten, wird immer mit zu unseren schönsten Urlaubsländern herumgehören. Im Osten steht unser Morgen. Welchen Dank für eure nationalsozialistische Gastfreundschaft. Hello and welcome to Movie Humpers. My name is Bob Shan. I am Angela. Any sounds you hear will be the dogs that run around this house. That and run the house. The dogs that run the house. It may be a cat or two that run it that are like the deep state of the house. <laughs> but uh, for this month, we're tacking on some extra episodes to catch up to some Best Picture nominees. Uh, the subcategory we're calling. And the nominees are. And we have seen about half of uh, the Best Picture nominees already. And so this month we're just watching the rest of them, breaking them down. And this movie I've been tracking for a little while. I've been wanting to see this at least since November. It was originally released last May to a limited screening. And, and then it was released again in December. But I think it only was in um, New York and L.A. Yeah. And then I think it was slowly trotted out in various areas in January, which it did that thing where it shows up briefly so it can qualify for the Academy, and then it starts to show up. But so far, I feel like this movie isn't as popular as I thought it was going to be in yeah. terms of how I'm seeing people discuss it, and I'll get more into that later. But we're talking about um, The Zone of Interest from 2023, directed by Jonathan Glazer, who directed Under the Skin, a movie that I don't hear people talk much about, but it is a good movie. It is a good movie. Like, I know, what what is it about Glazer's style? Um, this is also written by Jonathan Glazer, based on a book, very vaguely based on a book by Martin Amiss. Like, mm. a lot of liberties are taken on the book. He the, basically got the idea. Yeah, the, <laughs> almost like the title, <laughs> practically. <laughs> and it stars Christian Fradel and Sandra Hewler. Also, fun fact, the dog, the Weimariner, in the, was Sandra Hewler's actual dog. Aww. So that explains how the dog was always, was always following responsive her. to her That's in particular. That's really smart. But this movie is about Rudolf Haas and his family. And Rudolf Haas was an actual guy who was a long running commander of Auschwitz. Mm -hmm. And Auschwitz, of course, was a concentration camp in which hundreds of thousands to millions, uh, uh, this camp in Poland, in which uh, Jews, gypsies, homosexuals, a lot of Jews, mostly Jewish people, and a lot of people were uh, sent to be gassed or burned in ovens. I mean, it, it's a horror show that we've been talking about for well over a half a century, and for good reason. But uh, whereas many movies might focus directly on the literal horror of it itself, this movie is a horror in a different way in mm. which we look specifically and only at the lives of the everyday lives and families of those that live in this area, in this nice house, in this area that they call the zone of interest. And this house of this commander, this super sweet house that's big. It's got a greenhouse, a pool, a big garden. But the thing is, it's right up next to the wall in which you can see the housing. It was literally filmed at Auschwitz. Yeah. So this is the worst homeowners association ever in the history of homeowners associations, right? Yeah, you can you can see the smoke um, at one point. There is another family you visit for a moment, and, and the mother is closing all the windows very tight because you can smell 
yeah. the smells coming. You can hear everything. That's At kinda, one point... That's what I thought throughout the whole movie. The sense of things that they're having to adjust to here. Yeah. The smell alone. Alone, yeah. It's it's so crazy, too, because they have five children. Mm-hmm. They They are growing this family, and... They don't talk about it expressly, but their son is also in, like, the youth Nazi group. And there's a point where her mother comes to visit. Yeah. And her mom is staying for a little while. And, you know, she's showing her mom around the grounds. And every time her mom starts to try to ask, like, questions that are are more prying or more like, well, how do you feel about this? Or what do you think about that? The woman just like brushes it off and talks about like her vegetables or her flowers. And at one point she laughs and says, they call me the queen of Auschwitz. And it's like, you're insane. Like, I realize there has to be a level of delusion. Yeah. If you're going to raise your family there. But she is so deluded that when he later says he has to leave, she won't go with him. She's like, this is our home. This is where we've built this up. I'm raising my children here and they're happy. And her mother leaves in the night. Her mother gets so upset by the sounds and the 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 smells and what's happening. And her grandchildren are being brought up next to this as though it is completely normal and okay. And she doesn't even say goodbye. She just leaves. Yeah, yeah. And that's it. The mother she is... She knows there's no point in talking to her daughter about it. The mother can't mask it. Like she, you know, a lot of this is kind of more taking place out of sight, out of mind. But she's... Going to stay with her family, and it's literally right next to one of the most infamous and deadliest concentration camps in modern history. And she's, you can see her just looking out the window and just being completely disturbed by the whole thing. But yeah, there's this little side story in which Haas, the real Haas, was executed for war crimes mm. uh, after the, the Nazi regime fell. He's trying to advance within and he wants to become the premier commander of Auschwitz. But the politics and the bureaucracy, it's spending a lot of time. In some way, there is an attempt to humanize these people, I think. Mm -hmm. Because that's a part of the process of being disturbed by what's going on. To um, reflect that like these people are kind of like us. They're not much different than any other ordinary people in how their day-to-day lives. But that's what makes it more horrific. They want the best for their kids. They like to go have like little day trips. There's a part where he thinks that they're going to have to move to another area and that someone else is going to have to come and take over. And she doesn't want to leave. This is like her status symbol, right? And he thinks he's going to say goodbye. So he goes up to this horse that they go on horseback rides with. And he's telling the horse that he loves the horse, right? And it's like that weird moment like, well, he's attached to this thing, this animal, which we can relate to that. Mm -hmm. We can accept that. But at the same time, he is completely detached to the absolute, like, horror that's going on just over a wall. Yeah, he's talking in meetings with people. There's there's one particularly disturbing scene to me because of how matter-of-fact it is where these planners come to visit him and are talking about a new kind of crematorium that they have built. And you're right. Like, it, it's so... It's it's jarring how in one moment he can be like, I love this horse so much. And in the next moment, he can talk about tens of thousands of human beings being incinerated in yeah. an efficient way. Yeah, they they, so they use a specific word like cargo or some some specific word. That <laughs> yeah, they don't say people. They That they process units these or units. Like they yeah, really. It's really. And they're talking about how they're going to be shipping so many more from Hungary and. When they're out in the garden and they're spending time with the kids, you can hear gunshots. And yelling sometimes. And screaming and shit like that. And people berating. They'll be like walking down a nice little scenic trail by a little river and you can just hear screeches and gunfire and you know exactly what's going on. One thing that I wanted to ask you, because we literally haven't spoken about this movie since we watched it. There are these scenes of a young girl... My favorite scenes, honestly. Yes. And she is in, it's like night vision. Yeah. So it looks very different from everything else that you're seeing. It feels otherworldly. For a moment, it felt like a story, like it it was animated. It feels kind of the most of what we've seen from Glazer in terms of his approach, I think. Yeah. And so she's in the darkness. She's 
gathered up all these apples and she's taking them and hiding them around so that the workers in the concentration camp can find these apples, like the ones who are being made to do labor. Like she's hiding it in with their tools and putting them in places for them. And we do see her go back to her house at one point. And I couldn't tell for sure if she was the girl that was working for them. It gets, it got a little confusing for a second. I wasn't sure who she was exactly. It it wasn't the girl that was working for them. They have a Jewish housekeeper that the mother is not very kind to. And at one point. Every, she, she's like, I could have had your ashes spread all over these fields and stuff. And anytime the mother is stressed about their status or what's going to happen, she takes it out on the Jewish housekeeper. Um, but no, that wasn't the same girl. Apparently, Anna, for a second, I thought it maybe was like one of their daughters. I did too. I thought it was her oldest. But I think it was just a, a, another Polish girl that was living there. She's not a Jewish girl who did yeah. that. And when she she finds something, like something is left as she's leaving the apples because the, the people in the concentration camp are, are finding it. And you actually hear people get killed because they're fighting over Over what they find over the apples. But she finds sheet music in a little locket. Mm -hmm. And that's when she goes back to her house. We see she's playing an actual song that was written by someone who was, um, I think, a survivor of the concentration camp. Yes, yep. A very, very, uh, really hits you emotionally it really did and, and that was the house where when she came back that night where the mother was closing the windows because of the smell like all of a sudden she was like oh no and like got up because she i guess had had you know wanted to open the windows like you normally would but these were just polish people living in there yeah. in the neighborhood yeah so you've got these people who feel like they're like fucking royalty living because they're her the woman's husband is the head of Auschwitz and then you have just these people who live nearby and this little girl is literally risking her life yeah to go take these apples but it's it's like it's the only thing she can think to do mm-hmm. and it sorry and you see the apples spilled like throughout scenes like you see a horse like when they're riding their horses they're stepping over like a bundle of apples that may have been dropped yeah. And you don't know whether she dropped a bunch of apples or if the people she's leaving the apples for dropped a lot of them. I could have gotten caught with them. And, uh, you know, Glazer's approach to the filmmaking here, as I read on it, is that it wasn't so much. I mean, there are some tracking shots. There are a few shots that show things up close. But for the most part, it's almost like how they would film for like a Big Brother house. There's set cameras throughout the house. A lot of the time, the cameras are just positioned. The actors are just moving freely throughout the house, emulating the life and saying their lines. But the the approach of Glazer is to almost, almost like an anti-movie in a way, almost to just kind of doing the best he can to remove the presence of himself. So to where we see, where it just feels like we just happen to be almost like, peeking through time and observing yeah. and and it's a great approach because it allows a lot of space in these scenes and these images and it's the use of space in this movie is so important because you want that long shot you want to see anything that's like this family just doing these things and the 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 picturing something that appears to be mundane and then you see the top of those encampments poking above the wall and so that whole frame there and the 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 space of it is so important in this movie and it's an approach that glazer does that i've always even just from the one other movie i've seen i've just really appreciate that Mm -hmm. he compensates for a lot of movies where i feel like you know a lot of directors really suck at that like, you see a lot of, like, hacky kind of stuff, whether it be a show or a movie, where all the cuts are just right up on people's faces and shit. And often when a movie's going through reshoots and stuff, you can tell because everything is just so lasered on the faces and stuff. Like, it does seem like that there's a lot of, you know, people making content movie shows that are just really afraid to pull back. And when you, but when you pull back, that requires actual acting. Yeah. You know, 
So it's quite an interesting thing. And it seems to me like, I don't know if this will win Best Picture. And there is some greater cultural conversation that I will get into here in a minute. Regarding, because Glazer has stated that, like, this movie is not about the past, it's about the present. Mm -hmm. And there's a point in the movie in which, near the end, if it's not really a spoilery thing here. No. This movie has to be emotionally taken in. It's not something that can be spoiled. I can't correlate that feeling. You know, we do the best we can, but you still got to watch it. There's no real, like beginning middle ending story to give away but of course auschwitz now is a um a place you can go visit to learn about what happened there a lot of it is preserved the buildings and stuff rudolf haas is standing in this hall and then it cuts to the modern time workers cleaning the floors cleaning the windows Mm -hmm. and on the other side of the windows are just these piles of luggage from victims of the holocaust a room piles of shoes and they're cleaning the windows and making sure that this museum that represents a warning of a mass death from a, from a horrifying ethno nationalistic state is a warning to what you should be looking out for in terms of these ethno nationalism, ultra right wing nationalism and how it might attack an ethnic minority within its own bounds so it's brutal to see it. And, and at first you're not sure, like, what is this? Did they just throw that luggage there? Did they just throw that shoes there? But you see the workers there and they're using modern vacuum equipment. And it's like, no, that's right there. And then it cuts to Haas and he's standing in that same spot. But it's not a museum then. It is merely just a place of death right there. And then he walks down the stairs and then... It just, it bridges the present to the past. It does. It It's almost as though he's looking into the future for a moment. Or it's that idea of it all exists kind of in the same time, in the same space. Like I think Glazer represents that very well. Of course, we're talking about the banality of evil. The banality of evil is what every article points out about this movie. It's been said over and over and over again. And it's a thousand percent true. But Glazer also stated that this movie is about the present and i get that i feel that perhaps you know you think it it, maybe it regards the significant presence of anti-semitism in today's world which is still very much a legitimate concern or the presence of the legacy of atrocity itself and the legacy of the holocaust has absolutely and constantly reverberated into the present. Even if we don't see it, uh, you know, the inhumanity, the atrocity, it's uh, the social infection, it's a habit. And no people are immune to that, even those who have felt it. So I'm imagining the banality of today, right? How that banality of evil would manifest right now in this world where we all have cameras and camcorders in our pocket. What would it look like? Because yeah, I would like you to imagine like the structure and society that we saw in this film. Imagine something absolutely modern that is similar to that, but like a society that it has its own cultural differences, but espouses an extreme hard right ethno nationalism that has, you know, long rooted itself into its political fabric and social and philosophical identity, at least that uh, of which is in control. We will say that this hard right society strictly enforces certain living standards and areas for the ethnic minorities that have always existed generationally in this country. And those spaces allotted for them appear to be getting smaller and smaller over a long period of time. Imagine uh, a particular space in which this ethnic minority are herded and confined, a congested city right by the sea with a wall around it. And this country controls its borders on land and sea and controls what goes in and out of the walled city and who comes in and out. And when this country throws its military machine at the walled city and manages to force these ethnic populations away from their homes by the millions and and their homes and schools and hospitals get destroyed with tens of thousands of these people dead and counting. What does the banality 
of something like that look like? Uh, it's surprisingly easy to find. Uh, but I want to imagine it in the same way that Glazer showed us in his film. Studying and looking at not the obvious and inescapable suffering, but what are the people with the power and leverage to administer such monstrous amounts of collective suffering doing around each other or towards anyone other than those who are suffering the most? What if Rudolf Haas's kids had TikTok accounts? Never has such banality been so available for everyone to see. Imagine TikTok videos of an ethnostate's military looting the goods of people who are desperately trying to survive their power, taking the makeup of the ethnically cleansed back home to their wives or rooting through the lingerie of the dead. Imagine doing skits in bombed out schools, demolished apartments. Imagine uh, videos of lounging on a beach that has been violently removed of its previous inhabitants. Imagine members of this ethnostate riding bicycles abandoned by children who had fled with their family. Imagine going into their abandoned homes and mocking their existence in everyday lives. But truly, that isn't even as small and banal as that can go. Because between all of this, you can imagine a plethora of synchronized TikTok dances and thirst trap posts, and that is truly the most banal shit of them all. A, a shadow of pain and suffering, unseen but looming, always lingering in your mind, but what we see is the glow of a ring light on the face of an ethnostate agent doing a TikTok dance. What you can't see is all the more horrifying in your mind. You know, it's important to note that Jonathan Glazer completed this project prior to the Hamas attack in Israel on October 7th that killed 1,200 Israelis with a few hundred more taken hostage. To assume that Glazer is consciously reacting to that specific event with this film would not be accurate, nor is it to be presumed that it is some veiled reaction to Israel's response of over 25,000 deaths and counting amongst the displaced citizens of Gaza, with nearly half of those deaths uh, being children. This movie was initially released last May, but Glazer did say that this movie was about the present. The present is where we find ourselves despite our best intention, and I personally found it impossible to think about the legacy of what I watched without thinking of this current conflict and humanitarian crisis. I would think that even the most ardent Zionist would not be able to shut that conflict out of their mind when pondering the legacy of what they see in this film from where we all stand today. I think Glazer's film is masterful and important, and perhaps the timing of its release would make it too enticing a political tool. But as I read on the movie article sites on the culture and entertainment sites, the major ones. Uh, predictably, they seem to acknowledge this particular current affair very minimally, if not at all. And truly, I, I get it. The majority of anything said on an article about the movie should be mostly about the movie, of course. But I just can't pretend that when examining the legacy of the Holocaust into the present, in my mind, I can't somehow consider the humanitarian crisis in Gaza and the legacy of that as well. I can observe them separately in their own time, but if this is about the present, then that other stuff falls in there intentionally or no. So I'm somewhat surprised that discussion of this movie hasn't collided more with discussion of the events right now. Maybe it's kind of good because it certainly would get whipped up into the most bad faith <laughs> arguments, you know, uh, and this movie was released twice last year to limited screenings. We got it at the Bell Court, I want to say mid January, and it didn't even premiere in the UK until February. I feel like this movie isn't as popular as I thought it would be, which is unfortunate because Glazer made something very special here and he made it in an amazing way and he makes you think about it in a different way if it won best picture i would completely support that but if it does win best picture then what happens to the conversation around it then i, I guess we'll just have to wait and see what happens so yeah you're going to give this uh, one through five i'm going to give it one through five combined for best out of ten 
the legacy of the Holocaust is very real. I mean, no doubt. You can't avoid it. And I think the what he put here, it's a very emotional journey, very hard. And the legacy of it is still hard. It still manifests. It's still horror begets horror. And, um, yeah. Um... <laughs> but I don't know. This might actually be the best movie of the year. It might be. Um, I don't think I can, I don't think I would deny that. Yeah. I mean, just in terms of just pure filmmaking and what I like about it, Glazer's approach is what I would, what I would expect and what I would require of a good, intelligent movie. What you can conjure in your head almost seems worse, though. I couldn't imagine I could come up with anything worse than what actually happened at Auschwitz at that time. Um, I might actually still be surprised as vivid as my imagination can be. I'm going to give it a 4.75. Why not just give it a 5? I guess. Right? What do you, what do you think? Yeah. I mean, if you're over a four, it's just S tier. So it doesn't even matter. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. Four. I was going to say, I think I was going to say. 4.5 or 4.75. So, yeah, it's S tier. That sounds good. Yeah, it's totally... If we're both over a 4... No, not necessarily. But, yeah, if uh, if we're both at least at like a 4.75, then it's an S tier. So, the details beyond that don't matter. Yeah. Because when you're S tier, you're just on the list. As you can see... Oh, I pulled up the wrong one. Because when you're S tier, you're just on the list straight down the line. The bringing... A bag of the clothes of, that have been taken away. Yeah. Um, and then the women just like sorting through them like it's nothing. Yeah. Like every piece of those clothes belong to someone who, if they haven't had their life taken away, is being tortured. So let's take a look at the list. It is amongst some solid stuff. As you can see, the zone of interest is between the Wicker Man and There Will Be Blood. Not the uh, not the other Wicker Man, the one from the 70s. The, and, the, the good one. And, uh, yeah, so sharing the the high-end ranks of movies such as uh, Night of the Hunter, The Last Picture Show, Sunset Boulevard. It joins the ranks here. Will the Academy give this best picture? It has won uh, several festivals. Uh, and, but it doesn't seem to be as blowing up as much as everyone's just still talking about Barbie at this point, as of this recording, but you don't, we don't know. Maybe by the time this episode drops, things will be different. We will see. Although maybe it's for the best. I wouldn't want this movie to be used as some kind of callous excuse for the deaths of others, which maybe some would ascribe that to i mean we all know the climate in which we're in i feel like some of this goes back to the conversation we had when we're talking about american fiction in that people don't like to be challenged they don't like to be made to think about things like this and it's important and that's the whole reason i mean not listen i haven't read anything that he said but him talking about this movie being about now, I mean, that seems to be the whole reason that he made this movie is we cannot forget this because it could happen again. It has happened. It is happening. There's always an apocalypse somewhere, (sighs) truly. But people don't want to think about that. They want to watch Barbie and feel good about themselves. Yeah. Yeah. And we can't really say exactly any specifics at Glazer. I mean, I think it's... No, yeah, I don't know. It definitely is a warning. No doubt about that about all we could say about it so it's a quite it's quite a a experience but i think it's worth checking out and it is different than any holocaust movie you will see and in some ways maybe even more disturbing than you might even expect despite not actually seeing the horror firsthand we're kind of used to that aren't we having all the horror just out of the line of sight um in our own little zones of interest the suffering around us you know what are we going to do about it I don't know. Check the show notes for links and other places to, to find us. Um, like, subscribe. Let us know what you think about this movie. 
I can't imagine that anyone would be like, oh, this movie is not very good. Yeah. <laughs> Who would say that? Um, but if you have managed to, um, steal up and go through the emotional experience of this movie, let us know what you think about it. In the meantime, I think we got a, a, a couple more that are left for our, uh, best picture noms that we haven't seen. And this month is Women in Crisis. All month long, some good movies about women going through a lot of different uh, types of trouble. So come back to us soon, as soon as tomorrow, really. All right? Our sign-off feels very vapid. Uh, what is the sign-off? What is the sign-off for our Oscar picks? You are Knuff. <laughs> It feels dumber every it time. It feels really, especially <laughs> following this conversation, it feels so dumb. So let's just say. No, we'll go with you are enough. Okay. Say it. Say it again. You are enough. <laughs>